So the tremendous, tremendous chus, a great honor and a privilege to be here. Your place is very, very impressive. I'm very excited to be here today. And uh, to meet old and new friends, first of all, I want to thank my dear friend, Dr. Chaim Baruch Ranowitz. Abgil Bash, what an honor you came. What a schus, what a schus. A person, and a Ragnar. And it's a tremendous schus to be here today. So our topic that was selected for today is a fascinating one. Tshuva, Ooh, frightening word. We are going to deal with questions and answers. Fascinating, Shailas at Tshuva's Bahalacha. And since I heard a great deal about this place, and I heard there are tremendous scholars sitting here today, I came with a bunch of questions that you are supposed to try and help me figure out the correct halachic approach to solve these cases and these dilemmas. But I want to first start with a tremendous medish, with a very unknown, famous medish. That sounds strange, unknown, famous medish. The first part of it, everybody knows. The latter part is not so known. It's about Avoham Avinu. We just met him yesterday in the Pasha. And it says in the Medish, and this everybody knows, Avoham Avinu had a tent with four doors in all directions because he wanted to ensure there's always guests coming in and out. So everybody knows this. And when a person came in, a guest came in, Avoham Avinu would feed him the best lunch he ever had. And then he'd say, okay, so, so what do I have to pay? How much is it? And Avoham Avinu says, it's not about money. It's about thanking Yibarna Shiloilam. The money, the food doesn't come from me. It comes from above, from Hashem. And the guy says, listen, do me a favor. It's not for me. What do I have to write on the check? And Avraham Avinu says, you just have to bow down to the Yibarna Shiloilam and say thank you to him. So if the person agreed, great. If he didn't, so Avraham Avinu would say, well, that's $452. He says, what? Well, it's desert prices, you know. Up here in the middle of Be'er Sheva Desert, it's not like in Morristown, New Jersey. This everybody knows. Here comes a surprising part B of the Medish. Once a very old goy, an 80-year-old goy, comes into Avraham Avinu's tent. And he gave him this lavish dinner. And he said, thank you very much. This was unbelievable. So how much do I owe you? And Avraham Avinu said, it has nothing to do with me. Just thank you, Avraham Avinu, and say thank you to Hashem. And the guy says, this is, I'm not in that business. Do me a favor. Here's my credit card. Just charge me whatever it is. He says, but the, the food doesn't come from me. It comes from Hashem. And Avraham Avinu started giving him a combination of Eishat Toya, together with Osameach, together with uh, Gateways, and Chabad, and all the Q programs together. And he started arguing with him. And this guy was a stubborn old guy. Couldn't convince him. At one point, after a few hours of arguing, Avraham Avinu says to him, well, okay. So it's $452. And he paid, and he left. Avraham Avinu went to sleep that night. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to Avraham Avinu and said, you know, I'm very surprised with you, Avraham Avinu. You know, I have a lot of patience. I've been waiting for 80 years for this guy to do tshuva. You can't do more than a few hours? And Avraham Avinu got up in the middle of the night took his slaves, took some torches, and went seeking for this goy in the middle of the de desert of Be'er Sheva. He found him. He brought him back to his tent. He argued with him for the next few days and was able to convert him. So if an old, 80-year-old, stubborn goy can do tshuva, <coughs> we can all do tshuva. Today it happens to be the yod side of Harav Shach Zechet Tzadik Levocha. And he once came to one of the Baalei Tshuva Yeshiva's in Yerushalayim, in Osameach. And he met a guy there, so he said to him, can I get a bracha? And Arav Shach said, sure. Where are you learning? He says, I, I don't learn in this yeshiva. I'm not about tshuva. And Arav Shach says, but why not? Why are you not about tshuva? Everybody is supposed to be about tshuva. In fact, in Shabbos Kuf Nun Gimel, Rabbi Yezer teaches his students, you got to do tshuva one day before you die. And the students say, but do we know? We are counting upstairs. Are we privy to the records of Malach HaMavis? We don't know when our time is up. And Rabbi Yezid told him, that's exactly the point. You got to do tshuva every day. Who told you you will be here tomorrow? Do you have an insurance policy from HaKadosh Baruch Hu saying you're going to be here? Who says? And therefore, we are all supposed to be Baalei Tshuva. 
So Baalei Tshuva sometimes bring very, very interesting shilas, and we're going to start with the first case. Our boy said, we're going to need your help. Listen to this Maise, a true Maise. It's a Baal Tshuva who's already 20 years in the business. So he comes and he tells the rabbi, you know, 20 years ago, before I was from, I went to eat in a restaurant in Tel Aviv. Very, very not kosher restaurant. Very not kosher. The only kosher thing in that restaurant is probably the water. That's how unkosher that place is. Run by a Jewish owner, serving both Jews and non-Jews. So he said, I ate the best lunch I ever had. Delicious. And when it came time to pay, so the guy came over with the check. And I said, excuse me, I just had to go to the restroom for a second. And from the restroom, instead of coming back to the table and paying, he did vaivrach. He disappeared. He fled. And now he comes with a Shiloh. Tell me, do I have to pay the 500 shekels that it cost me 20 years ago or not? So the rabbi says, what's the Shiloh? Why won't you have to pay? You're a Ganov. You stole 500 shekels. But wait a second. This guy's already 20 years of Baal Shuvah. He's a Lamdan. And he says, Rabbi, it's not so Pashut. 20 years ago, what exactly did I take? When you steal something, HaKadosh Baruch commands in his Torah, Veheshiv es Asher Gazal. Veheshiv es Akzela. You must return that which you have taken. But what exactly did I take? You look at me very puzzled. Let me explain. We have a Shulchan Oroch in the world. Shulchan Oroch Yoredea. Simen Kuf Yud Zayin. It's very easy to remember what save because there's only one save. There's Seif Aleph. And the Shulchan Oroch maintains that one is not allowed to benefit from something which is an Isu Torah. Which means, we know that the Torah says we're not allowed to cook meat and milk. It says it three times because you're not allowed to eat it, you're not allowed to cook it, and you're not allowed to sell it and benefit from it. But Chazal, but they extend this isu, this prohibition, to anything which is an isu, you're not allowed to benefit from. And if that's the case, the Jewish owner of the restaurant was not allowed to sell this to me, so it has zero value. If zero value I took, what exactly do I have to give back? And therefore he asks the rabbi, and the rabbi asked me, to run to Morristown, to Feres Bechurim, and ask, Rabbi Yisai, what do you say? Does he have to pay back or not? By the way, it gives me great pleasure to be here today because the name that this place carries, to Feres Bechurim, is very close to my heart. I used to daven many times with Maron Rav Eliashiv Zecher Tzadik Levrocha, who passed away about five years ago, and his shul in Mea Shorim, New Shalayim, was also to Feres Bechurim. It's a tremendous chus to be here today. Rabbi say, what do you say? Does he have to pay back 500 shekels or not? Not everybody together, just one at a time. I'm sorry? No, he'll never be arrested. The guy doesn't know. That's not the shayla. It's not a legal shayla. We want to know what is a Kodesh Baruch who want. Does he have to pay or not? You know why I think he did? He does have to pay. I'll tell you why. Why? Let me ask you something. What if I steal from you a burnt, broken toothpick? Do I have to give it back? How much is it worth? It's less than Shvepruta. Is there a mitzvah to return something which is less than Shvepruta? You're still not allowed to steal. We pass him, also minatoya. One is not allowed to do something, even if it's less than the minimal shear, but you're still not allowed to do it. However, there is no returning because it's less than a shweputa. So if he was not allowed to sell at that time, so it's less than a shweputa. If it's less than a shweputa, why do I have to return? Does it have an influence on? Of course, of course, that is our question. Since it's not kosher, he was not allowed to sell it. If he wasn't allowed to sell it, there is no value. If zero value I took, zero value I'll return. I'll give you an example. If somebody steals chametz she'ava olav ha'pesach, Chazal imposed a penalty on chametz owned by a Jew which was not sold before Pesach, and you are not allowed to benefit from it. 
So what if I steal this type of chametz? Do I have to give it back? If I give it back, you know what the Gemara says? I give it back and I say, Here, do whatever you want with it. You can't do anything with it. It's also be'ano. So why does he have to give back if it's valueless? Somebody want to answer me? Yeah. Good. And um, also, um, the concept that uh, that there's two separate things that he did wrong. Okay, he, he ate trade, but that doesn't determine whether he can steal uh, by uh, The fact that he ate treif is a problem that he has with the boy and Separate. Separate issue. The question is, does he have to give back the money that he took or that he used, he benefited from, if the guy wasn't allowed to do it? It's such a severe issue that, according to most poiskim, a Jew is not allowed to be a waiter in a non-kosher restaurant because he, again, is benefiting from the non-kosher food. So the Jewish owner was not allowed to sell this, therefore there was no value. If there was no value, why should he have to return? If he wasn't allowed to sell it, why does that mean it's no value? If you sell air, how exactly will I return air? It's air. That's the value that it had at that time, 20 years ago. Not everything that you're not allowed to sell is something that doesn't have value. If you're not allowed to benefit from it, it's as if we were to say to you, you have to consume it in fire. He's not allowed to benefit from uh, uh, potato salad he made on... Uh, okay, fine, good. But I said before, the only, non -kosher, the only kosher thing there was probably the water. You want to give him something for sitting on his chair, there's also some kind of a benefit. Five shekels for that and for the music, he'll get another three shekels. Um, what else is there? The beautiful decor they had on the... Another 15 shekels. Instead of 500, let's narrow it down to 450. Interesting. But we are looking for Shura Sadin. We are looking to know what is the din. If I want to be a nice guy afterwards, I can find a lot of mitzvahs to do Kiddush Hashem. We want to find out if there is an Indian, halachically, to give back the 500 shekels. It's not so pashut, by the way, to give back Aveda to Agoy. Only if you know there will be a Kiddush Hashem or you're allowed to do it. Otherwise, you're not allowed to give back a Kiddush, uh, an Aveda to Agoy. Because if the owner wasn't allowed to benefit, the value attached to that item which he stole is zero. So zero, he has to give back. But at the moment, he just stole $500. Well, what did he, he did not. It's $500 that you're not allowed to own. So he didn't take anything from you. He did you a favor. He saved you. You're supposed to ask me, but wait a second. We all know that in the slaughtering houses, many times when there's a treif chicken, we do sell it to the goyim. How does that work? We just said you're not allowed to benefit from it. The answer is, one is not allowed to be in the non-kosher business. But if it's what's called niznamenlo, I'm in the kosher business. I slaughter kosher chickens. Every so often I get a non-kosher one, that you're allowed to sell. But this guy was in the non-kosher business and therefore he wasn't allowed to sell. The Rashba explains that the reason for this is because we're afraid. If you're going to sell non-kosher food, you're going to come to eat from it. It's very easy. That's what waiters do. That's what owners do in restaurants. They eat their food. And the shach and the taz in Kuf Yudzei Yoridea, they bring this, they bring the rash, but that is the reason. So this question went to Rabbi Yoshev Zecher Tzadik Levrocha. And he said, what a brilliant insight. Rabbi Yoshev says, what do you say? That it was valueless at the time? You're wrong. You know why? Because that morning, 20 years ago, when the owner got up, he could have said, no longer am I in the non-kosher food. I'm in the kosher food business. I'm in the kosher restaurant industry. And at that point, instantly, everything non-kosher in the restaurant becomes nizdamenlo. It becomes something which you're allowed to sell. So it does have a value. So don't tell me you stole nothing. You stole 500 shekels. 
But he didn't do tshuva. You're right, but he could have. You see the koyach of tshuva, it can turn zero to 500. With what? With a thought of tshuva. He didn't do anything. The thought that he may have wanted to do tshuva can change from zero to 500. If it can do that to non-kosher food, imagine what it does to you. <laughs> imagine what it can do to your neshama. How it can elevate you. Talking about food and talking about tshuva and talking about money. How much does it cost to bring a yid back? How much does it cost to create a Baal Tshuva? Do you know? Moire de Kamaisi. Rebbe Tzenkarnieski, Aloya Asholom, passed away about five years ago. Kol Emoy Tzuk is Shabbos. I'm going to tell you an unbelievable story about her. But we start going down south to Be'er Sheva. Familiar with Be'er Sheva? Like the Rebbe is especially for you. There was a female commander in the Israeli army in a base in Be'er Sheva. This lady was very, very secular, very anti. Anything that looked black and white was, oh, stay away, that's the enemy. Yeah, unfortunately, there are some people like that. She had all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems. And she was telling one of the soldiers there in the base about her problems, her girlfriend. So she tells her, you know, there's a very, very big Rebetzin in Bnei Bak. Her name is Rebetzin Kanievsky. Maybe you should go get a bracha from her. You never know. What? I should go to the rabbis, to the rabbis. It's not for me. What do you have to lose? You tried everything else. What do you have to lose? No, 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 no. She convinced her and convinced her. And then she said, you know what? I'll come with you. You'll come with me. I don't know. I don't know. Fine. They took a bus from Be'er Sheva to Bnei Bak. It's a long ride. They get to Bnei Bak. And they ask people, how do I get to the house of Reb Chaim Kanievsky? Take this bus. They wait 45 minutes for the bus. They get on the bus. And after five minutes, there's a young guy sitting in front of them, studying, sitting, his head is in the Gemara. So, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. He is in the Gemara. Excuse me! Yeah. How do I get to the house of Reb Chaim Kanievsky? Oh, oh, you got to get off here. Oh, thank you very much. They get off the bus, and they look around. They don't know Bnevak. So they ask someone, how do you get to the house of Reb Chaim Kanievsky from here? Here? Why did you get off here? You have another two stops. So this commander says to a friend, you see, I told you, they hate us. They saw us. We're not dressed as they would like us to be dressed. They don't want us to come to the house of Reb Chaim Kanievsky. They hate us. Let's go back. Back to Be'er Sheva. And a friend says to her, but you're already here. What do you have to lose? Let's go, let's go. She says, no, they hate us, they hate us. She convinced her a little more. She says, okay, fine. They waited another 45 minutes for the next bus. Hopped on the bus. They get off this time in the right stop. And they walk to the house of Reb Chaim Kanievsky. I don't know if you're familiar with Reb Chaim Kanievsky, but the house has some steps going up. In the middle of the steps, there's the guy sitting and blocking. You can't go up. And they look around, and they can't believe it. It's the same guy from the bus, from before. So the commander says to the friend, you see, I told you, they hate us so much, this guy came, he made sure he's going to protect this place, that we don't come in. You know what? I'm not going to be, I'm going to go straight through. I don't care about this guy anymore. And she says to him, excuse me, excuse me, slicha, slicha, excuse me, excuse me. And he looks, and he says to him, oh, it's you. I was waiting for you. You were waiting for us? Yes. You know, we shared the same bus ride before, and I felt so terrible. I realized what I did. I told you to get off on the wrong stop. I was in the middle of my learning. I didn't know what was going on. I felt so bad, but you already left. And I wasn't supposed to come here today, but I changed everything, and I came here today just to apologize. Please say that you can find it in your heart to forgive me. I feel so bad. And while he's saying it, he took out a little bag from his pocket, and he gives them, and he says, here's Eight shekels and 40 yagorot, that's the bus ride that I caused you to take another bus. So it's four shekels and 20 yagorot each. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And they couldn't believe it. They never saw anything like it. They go upstairs. And they get into Rebetz and Kanievsky and they tell the whole Maise. And Rebetz and Kanievsky says to them, you see? What the values of Toya can do to a person can mold them into such a mensch. What a beautiful, beautiful midois. This is what Bnei Toyah are like. And this commander says to Rebetzin, 
if this is what they represent, if this is the group, I want to become one of those people. She became a Balas Tshuva. Today she has eight children in the best yeshivas and seminaries in Eretz Yisrael. So how much does it cost to bring a person back? A buck and a quarter. Four shekels, 20 ago you can make a Balas Tshuva. If you do everything right. Midas Tovis. You change a person, and in fact you change the world entire. So as we said, Baal Yitzhua many times have interesting shilas. Listen to the following shayla. Maran Arav, Aaron Leib Shteyman, Yemitz Hashem Yishudav Refua Shleyman, he was just released from the hospital yesterday, and he needs Rachmei Shemaim. You know, he's young, he's only 104 years old. He needs Rachmei Shemaim and Refua. So maybe we should dedicate this year for his Refua, complete spirit Refua. He was asked a fascinating question by a Baal Tshuva and a fascinating question by a Baalas Tshuva, a boy and a girl. The guy asks him, Listen, I'm on my way. I'm slowly getting into it, but whoa, whoa, there's a lot of things to do, a lot of things to change. <laughs> so I'm willing to take upon myself one thing. You tell me what. I'm willing to take upon myself either Shabbos, I'm going to become a Shoyim Shabbos, or Tahara Samishpacha, family purity. I'm married. What is it? And don't tell me to combine because it's not happening. I'm not there yet. I'm willing to take one thing on myself. Tahara Samishpacha or Shabbos. This is a Baal Shuvah's question. A Baal Shuva asks Rav Steinman another interesting question. I, she says, am also on my way, and I'm willing to take on myself one thing. I don't have a lot of money. I have 250 shekels. And with that, please guide me and tell me what do I do. Do I cash on my kitchen or I cash on my wardrobe? Tznius or a kosher kitchen? What do I do? Let's start with the guy. Boy, say, what do you say? Help Rav Steinman. He was just released from the hospital. Shabbos or Tara Samishpacha? You're quoting a Chazal. Chazal say that keeping Shabbos has the weight corresponding to all the mitzvahs. And if somebody doesn't admit in Shabbos, it's as if he's a heretic. So therefore you say, Shabbos. Pashut. Anyone wants to disagree? Or to bring another source? He said something else. What do you say, Abay say? Everybody agrees? You're sending us to Yuma Peivav. Where Chazal say, why is it that we are allowed to violate Shabbos to save a person? Violate one Shabbos in order to make sure that he keeps many Shabbos in the future. So you're saying with him, let him keep Shabbos. No, I'm saying do. I'm saying do Tarasa Tar- 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 Mishpacha. Tarasa 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 Mishpacha.
So in both ways, we see a big heckel that he's a Jew. His wife is going to agree to whatever he says. He's the boss. I think you got it mixed up. Okay. Kosher is not the issue with the guy. That's the girl's question we're going to get to in a second. He wants to know, Shabbos or Tawas HaMishpacha? Tefillin are great. We recommend it to everyone almost every day of the year. But he's asking us, right now, only Shabbos or Tawas HaMishpacha. And we have to answer the question at hand. Beautiful. Beautiful. Give all dick. One is not allowed to live in a place where there is no mikveh. Fantastic. Mm. Good, good. Shmir is Shabbos with everything that Shabbos entails. That's where it starts. That's when a person is not giving you the options and you're telling him what to do. But he comes with the question, what should I prefer? But normally, in order to assess which is more severe, we have to look at the punishment. What's the punishment for violating Shabbos? Call us? Skila. The most severe punishment out there. Skila, if a person did it, be amazed. What's the punishment for Tara Samishpacha? Kares. Kares or Skila? Which has more weight? Skila. So our answer is Pashut. It's Shabbos. But before we answer, let's go and attack the girl. What did she ask us? <laughs> kosher kitchen or kosher wardrobe? Sneas or kashus? Kitchen. kitchen. Why kitchen? So Mimele will affect the outside as well. Nice. Anyone disagrees? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Punishment. I just gave you the secret, huh? No, but I'm also a son of a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Rabbi. Well, why do you say? Sneas or Kashrus? Well, uh, it's so well versed in the Allah, so which one is the holding and zero and they're going in this verse? First of all, what's the whole background of being tied up? The background is being born a Jewish person. Boom, you're 12 years old as a girl. You're high in all mitzvahs. I don't care what your background is. You may not know, which will impact punishment, but you're high in all mitzvahs. That's what I came to ask you. That's a great, that's the $50,000 question. I don't know. Because it's new, basically it's more for other people. Because not see her, not making other people see it. And you're saying, you come first. So you have to take care of yourself. So therefore, you should kasher your kitchen. Is that what you're saying? I'm not sure, because I think if you bring other people, they have enough. So maybe it's a bad influence for their environment. Excellent. 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 Oh. I thought that's just because it's in fashion now. <laughs> You're saying uh, there's another reason. Yeah. I see. <laughs> you should know there's actually a source to wearing black and white in the Gemara. For Bali Chuba. 
פילי פלוי במאייסה. מועד קטן דף י"ז, I believe, and חגיגה דף ט"ז, the Gemara says a remarkable thing. What should a person do if he suddenly feels an urge to do an Avera? There's a Gemara like this, I didn't make it up. The Gemara says, Yilbash Shechoyrim, he should wear black and go to a place where no one knows him, V'yaseh Masheli Boi Chafetz, and then do whatever he wants. That's what the Gemara says. Rashi and Toises explain because we, min, we want to minimize the Chilul Hashem involved. So wear different attire, go to a place where nobody knows you, and do what you need to do. Rabbeinu Hananel explains, we hope that on the way there you will think to yourself, what am I, nuts? I have to pack my suitcases, take a flight to a place where nobody knows me, I have to change my clothes, I gotta be crazy. And then by the time you get there, you'll change, you'll turn around, you'll come back, and you will not sin. But... There is a sefer from about 350 years ago from a Mekubal who explains this Gemara totally different. And he says, when the Gemara says, what should a person do if he feels his Yetzer is taking the better of him? What Yetzer? Not Yetzer, huh? The only Yetzer, the Yetzer at all. If you feel you want to become fru, you want to connect to Kodesh Bochum, but you're so embarrassed. What are people going to say? What are my neighbors, family? Gonna, Look what happened to him. Ooh, what happened to him? So you know what you should do? Suggests the Gemara. Go to a different town where nobody knows you. Put on black like a normal Haredi dress code and do Mashali Boy Chafetz and do what your heart really desires. What is your heart desires? We know that from the Rambam. When a person does not want to divorce his wife, even though Beis Din said he must divorce his wife, what do we do to him? We beat him up until he will say, oh, okay, I want to. What do you mean you want to? You don't want to? Yes, you do. It's just you're clouded right now by the Yetzirah, but your real inner you Yetzer HaTov wants to. So when the Gemara says, Yasem HaSheli Boi Chafetz, do what your heart really desires, it's referring to the Yetzer HaTov. How? Wear a black coat. We have a source in the Gemara. However, let's get back and answer our nice two guys that came with a question. Rev Steinman, the Chiddush in this, in the first question of the guy, was that Rev Steinman didn't know what to answer and went to Rebel Yoshev Zatzal to ask him. That in itself is a big Chiddush. Rebbe Yoshev says, Shabbos or Taras HaMishpacha? Taras HaMishpacha. Why? Two reasons. Taras HaMishpacha is two people sinning. Shabbos is only you. Taras HaMishpacha comes first. Two for the price of one, but more than that. In Baba Metziah Lamed Beis, we learn that Kfiyah Sayetza, succumbing, beating the Yetzer Hara is a tremendous thing. How does the Gemara learn it? You have to help your friend unload his donkey. It's a mitzvah's essay in the Torah. It's a positive commandment. Why? The animal is suffering. But what if, the Gemara asks, you have your donkey's friend and you need to help him unload. And you have the guy which you can't stand and you have to help him load the animal and cause her extra suffering. What should you prefer? And the Gemara says, you should help your enemy first. Why? Because we don't like you not liking other Jews. What does it mean? You hate another Jew? We have to be koife the yetzer. You have to kill your yetzer hara and go and help, even though it's going to entail additional suffering to the animal. We prefer that, even though tsar barechaim is diuraisa. So Rebbe Yoshev explained, Taras HaMishpacha, there's a tremendous yetzer for that, but we don't find such a yetzer to violate Shabbos. So you see from the Gemara, it's a very big Indian to be koife the yetzer. So we have two people sinning as opposed to one. We have the Indian of kfiyah sa yetzer, and therefore Rabbi Yoshev said, you should prefer tara sa mishpach. And what about our girl? Kosher, or tznias? Tznias. One reason, like you explained. Tznias, it's not only you sinning, you're causing others to sin. Every time you step out of the house, you're causing all the men to sin. So it's, again, two or multiple people as opposed to one, but more than that. We have a big rule. When you have something which is rabbinic in nature or from the Torah in nature, the Rabbanon or the Uraisa, what should we prefer? The Uraisa. All the questions you will have in the kitchen are the Rabbanon, because nothing was cooked here in the last 24 hours. 
It's all the Rabbanon. Nothing is what's called Ben Yoim, or nothing was used here in the last 24 hours. You can also eat vegetables. What's the problem? So it's only a the Rabbanon type of Isurim, type of prohibitions. Well, sneers is the Uraisa. So, of course, you should prefer the Uraisa, and you're causing others to sin as well, over the Rabbanon, and therefore that was the answer. But we should wish these people, both the guy and the girl, that Mitzvah Shem, they should be able to keep all. Tar Yag Mitzvah Shebetoya. This place, you know, is so impressive to me. It reminds me of a Maise. Down south, south from here, Maryland. There was a Yid who wanted to go to college. I'm just it's reminded because this place is so big. It's like a, a college campus. So this guy wanted to go to a certain college in Maryland, a Catholic college. This guy grew up with zero background in Torah or mitzvahs. And he went for the interview, and the dean of the place <clears throat> was a Catholic priest. So he was worried if he's going to find out he's Jewish, he's probably not going to want to accept him. So he didn't look Jewish, and he didn't think he was going to be asked. He went into the interview, and he starts talking, and he was very impressive, so he made a good impression. But then the priest asks him, tell me, are you Jewish? I guess there's something about us. I don't know what it was. Maybe the horns. I don't know. I don't know. Are you Jewish? And the guy starts thinking, what do I do? If I say yes, I'm not going to be accepted. If I say no, I'm lying. And I'm not a liar. And suddenly, he found the, the courage, and he said, yes, I am, knowing this is it. But suddenly, the priest says to him, you're Jewish? You're accepted. One condition, though. You must come to me every week for an hour and a half appointment twice a week, every single week. Is that okay with you? Sure. No problem. He comes in for the first appointment. And the priest asks him, what do you know in Gemore? What was that? Okay, Gemore. What is that? You don't know Gemore. <coughs> you know Mishnayos? Is this Chinese? What are you saying? Do you know Chumish? What is Chumish? What are these words? You know Aleph base? I don't know what you're saying. The priest started teaching him Aleph base. And then Gimel Dalet. And the following week, He and Vav. And Zion and Chet. And the whole Hebrew Aleph base. Four or five weeks later, he started teaching him Chumish Bereshis. Bereshis Ba'o Eloikim. A few months later, he started teaching him some Mishnayos. He comes every week, twice. And a few months later, he started teaching him Gemot. <coughs> three years. At the end of the three years, he's about to leave the college. So he says to him, so, but what do I do now? Where do I go now with all this information and knowledge? What's my next step? And the priest tells him, you go to Rabbi Wooderman in Neri Yisod in Baltimore. There's a yeshiva there. You should go there. Okay. Can I ask you something? What in the world was going on here in the last three years? Why are you teaching me my religion? And the priest says, let me explain. Years ago, I took a sabbatical. And many priests do that. They take a sabbatical and they go to Israel to spend the year. My first Friday night, I went to the Koisel Amaravi, Wailing Wall. I went to the Koisel. And I was so overwhelmed. So many Jews davening with such concentration and focus and enthusiasm and excitement. And they're swaying back and forth. And I never saw anything like it. And suddenly I felt a little tap on my shoulder. Yeah? This guy with the white beard he says, Hey, how you doing? You're visiting? Where are you eating tonight? In my hotel? No, you're not eating in your hotel. You're coming to me. He's Rabbi Noach Weinberg, Zechet Tzadik Levrocha. He started, Eish Atoya. So I came to him. Fantastic meal. It was great. The food, out of this world. And we sang, and he gave all kinds of great thoughts. And then he said, so where are you eating tomorrow? In my hotel. No, no hotel on Shabbos. You're coming to me. So I came to him for lunch, and lunch was out of this world. And then he said to me, why don't you come to my yeshiva on Sunday? So I came. And Rabbi Weinberg saw a tremendous potential in me. 
This is what the priest is saying. So he started teaching me the out of base. And then he taught me Chumash. And then he taught me Mishnais. And then he taught me Gemara for a whole year. And at the end of the year, I was supposed to go back. I have a job to catch. I'm a priest. So I tell Rabbi Weinberg, okay, so thank you so much. I'm, you know, next week I'm out of here. And Rabbi Weinberg put so much pressure on me. No, no, don't leave the yeshiva. Stay here. Why do you have to go to America? Stay here for a little more. I said, I can't. I can't. I have to go back. They're waiting for me. What do you mean they're waiting for you? Who's waiting for you? No, no, it's okay. I didn't want to tell him. But he put so much pressure. I caved. And I told him, you know, I'm not Jewish. I'm a Catholic priest. And Rabbi Weinberg started crying. And he told him, you should know, I'm not moichel you, not in this world and not in the next. I don't forgive you. I invested so much time, so much energy in you. I thought you were Jewish and I taught you everything. That you'll be able to continue and maintain your life as a Jewish person. I'm not moichel you. I don't forgive you, not in this world and not in the next. And the priest started crying. Please be moichel me. Forgive me, forgive me. I'm not moichel you. Forgive me. Rabbi Weinberg told him, I will forgive you on one condition. If at one point throughout your life, you will have the opportunity to teach a Jew what I taught you, and you will, then I will forgive you. And three years ago, when you came to me to the interview, and you said you're Jewish, and you don't know anything, I said, wow, this is my mechila opportunity. This is my forgiveness from Rabbi Weinberg. He sent, to me, he sent me you from Shemaim. And therefore, I taught you last three years everything that I knew in order to ask forgiveness from Rabbi Weinberg Zatzal. You never know what your actions will, how they will impact others in the future. You see, you even teach a goy what that does. Not that I recommend go and find going and teach them Aleph Beis, Chumash, Mishnah, and Gemoy. But you never know what we said before. The guy on the bus asking forgiveness, smiling, doing the right thing, how it can impact one person and in fact how it can impact the world entire. Now, guys, we're traveling to Netanya. Have you been to Netanya? We have a Shaila coming from Netanya. A Froom guy passed away. He left 12 million shekels. Let's talk in dollars. 12 million dollars to his son and daughter. His son and daughter went off the derech big time. If the derech is here, they're right there. They're very, very not Froom. Both the boy and the girl. In his will, he wrote, I want to give $10 million to my boy and $2 million to my girl. One condition. I want my son to go every day to the shul three times a day and say, Kaddish for my neshama. If he misses one Kaddish throughout the year, one Kaddish, then the $12 million should be divided equally. $6 million to the boy and $6 million to the girl. And when they opened the will and his daughter saw that, she says, yes, easy money. My son, will, my, my brother will never be able to do it three times a day. Are you kidding me? Early morning, after work, not happening. So what did she do? She hired a private detective to follow her brother to see. And all we need is for him to miss one Kaddish, one davening, and that's it. She just earned how much money? Four million extra because she's already getting two million but if it will be divided equally, she'll get six, so four million. Worthwhile investment, private investigator, no problem. The private investigator follows her brother, and he sees this guy, unbelievable. He gets up early morning, he goes to shul, he stands there like a mourner among people who are in the middle of the wedding. No talis, no tefillin, he just stands there and waits for somebody to point to the sitter, now. So he says the Kaddish, now. He doesn't daven, he doesn't do anything. Fine. He finishes his work. He comes back for Mincha Mairev. Mincha. Stands here like this. When, when, when? Now. Kaddish, 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 Kaddish. Mincha stops. Mincha ends. And the rabbi there gives a little shear between Mincha Mairev. As soon as he hears words of Torah, he splits. And he asks the rabbi, if you don't mind, when you finish, before Mairev starts, come out and call me. I'd like to say Kaddish for my father. He says, sure, no problem. So this is how it's been working. He comes for Mincha, he goes right after Mincha. Mariv, the rabbi, calls him back and he stands and he says his Kaddish and he splits. Three months like this. After three months, the detective, investigator, calls the daughter and says, listen, I think you're wasting your money. 
your brother is unbelievable. He's so committed. He never misses a davening. What? He comes early morning. Yeah, I follow him. He's there. He's one of the first people there. Wow. He comes from Mincha? Yeah. He leaves after Mincha. Oh! No, no, but he comes back. How does he know? How does he know how to come back? So he explains. He asks the rabbi to call him. And the rabbi comes out and he calls him and says, okay, thank you very much, my friend. Thank you very much. She immediately picks up the phone. She finds out, who is this rabbi? And listen to what she suggests to the rabbi. Dear rabbi, she says to him, I understand that you have some kind of a deal with my brother. You know my brother, the guy who recently came into Yeshua. You should know he's not into this at all. He doesn't believe in anything that he's doing. He doesn't like your davening. He doesn't like anything. He is in there for the money. You know what money? We're talking about 12 million shekel that my father left. If he's going to miss one minion, one, he's going to lose out, and I'm going to get the six million. So Rabbi, I want to offer you something. I understand that you are responsible for him coming for my It's only because you go out and you call him. I also understand there's a lot of needy people in your community. So how about this? If you don't call him one evening, I'm only talking about one evening. I'm not talking about something active. Just be passive and stay in shul. Forget to call him. You don't have a contract with him. Forget to call him. If you do that, I will get extra 4 million shekels. Out of that, I will give 10% to your needy people in the community. I will give you 400 shekels, 400,000 shekels to distribute to the people in your community. Rabbi, what do you say? Whoa. The rabbi was very confused. What do you do? And therefore, he asked me before I left Eretz Yisrael last week to come here quickly <laughs> and to ask the boy side, Dayani Mumrim. The boy side, Dayani Mumrim. What do you say? What do you say? He forgets, sends him to another shul, Davin Mara, takes the project. You can eat the cake and somehow it should stay full. It just doesn't work. It's either or. Now, boy, say, what do you say? Help out the rabbi. Yeah. But that's not really going to help us. If he's going to tell, tell someone else to do it, he was not going to miss the Kaddish. If he's not going to miss the Kaddish, he shouldn't get any of the money. The daughter is not going to get any of the money. Excuse me? How did I sin? Am I committed? Do I have a contract with him? Do I owe him anything? I forgot. But what kind of a Kaddish it is? It's a Kaddish without any Kavana. All he's in is for the money. So his, his, uh, he has Kavana, like he said, the Rambam. <laughs> Very good. You're sending us to help us get it in the Rambam. There is no Shoichad. There is no Shoichad. It's called a business deal. $400,000 of a business deal. Why Shoichad? Shoichad is to a judge. I'm offering you to forget. You never forgot anything in your life? Just forget something once. I would make a Jew with your brother. What's that? I would make a Jew with your brother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> brother, you offer me 400,000. What do you offer? Deal. Very good. Also, you have a Mitzvah, so if he does, uh, what, nine more months of Kaddish, then it could very easily cause a Mitzvah. Could even use Maybe, but there are $400,000 there for needy people that need it now to be able to eat, to make Shabbos next Shabbos. What mission did I give in front of Eva? What stumbling block did I put before a blind person? I'm not doing anything active. I'm staying back. I'm being passive. To put a stumbling block, you have to be active. I didn't tell him. He asked me, and I said, okay. I'm not allowed to forget anything throughout a year. I'm just human. Money comes from a Kodesh Baruch, you say, not from not good smelling business deals. Can I ask you a question? And, uh, the destruction of the second base of Migdash. It's the same 
question is, do sacrifice or not do sacrifice? Interesting. You're what sending us to Gitin Daf Nun Vav Amud Beis, where we learn the story about Zechariah ben of Kulas. Fantastic. This Shaila went to Reb Steinman Shlita. The rabbi came to ask him, and he told him the whole Maise. He says, what do I do? Do I keep calling him or not? And Reb Steinman says, you know, all your calculations are fascinating. What about the girl? What about the guy? What about $400,000? And what about the anim in your neighborhood? You're just forgetting one thing. Tell me, who does this money belong to? The father that died. What did he want? That Kaddish should be said to him the entire year. So all these calculations are, have nothing to do with this. You have to honor the request of the person who's no longer here. He owns the money. Fine. So the rabbi says to Rav Steinman, but wait a second. Doesn't this involve bizarre not Torah? It's a disgrace to Torah. You know, as soon as I open my mouth, the first word of the shir, boom, the guy runs out. Chas v'shulam. He's going to hear divrei Torah. It's bizarre not Torah. It's a disgrace to Torah. Rav Steinman opened up his big eyes and said to him, excuse me? Is your name Mr. Torah? What do you mean bizarre not Torah? Continue calling him. You know what happened? He continued calling him. Because when you go and you ask a shayla to a chacham, you have to listen. Two weeks later, the brother, whom he calls every day, he asks the rabbi after shul, tell me, I want to ask you something. Tell me, are you insulted? Are you offended that as soon as you start your shir, I leave? No, not at all. Really? You don't, it doesn't bother you? No. How come it doesn't bother you? And the rabbi says, you know what I do in this year? I give free diamonds and pearls to those who are present. Somebody who doesn't want diamonds and pearls, I'm not going to force him. So what do you mean he give diamonds and pearls? This is what I do. So what do you mean? He says, Pasuk and Mishli says, The Torah is more precious than pearls. There's nothing, nothing in this world that comes close to it. I give free diamonds and pearls. If somebody doesn't want it, I'm going to force him? This is really how you view Torah? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll come in one of these days, check it out. You're welcome if you want. The following day he came in. And he saw it's true. It's more precious than pearls and diamonds. He continued coming. After three weeks, he started keeping Shabbos. <laughs> By the end of the year, he was full French fum. And therefore, the four <laughs> extra, <laughs> the four million shekels that he got, now he is going to give money to the Maisa to the anim that he's going to decide. When you listen to a chacham, you go and ask a shayla, and you listen to G'doy Le'ado, you will never stumble. And the rabbi continued, and he listened, and we created another Yid. Keeping Torah Mitzvah today is a full-fledged Shomer Torah Mitzvah. <coughs> Let's ask another shayla. This is coming from up north. You know, a few years ago, there were all kinds of missiles and all kinds of problems in the north. So people were very afraid. There's a lady who became a Balas Tshuva. Very careful and strict to observe everything. But her husband, very not Baal Tshuva. The lady came with a Shaila. Tell me, I don't have a mezuzah on the doorpost. Am I allowed to steal money from my husband in order to buy a mezuzah to put on the doorpost? How can you have a Jewish house without a mezuzah on the doorpost? What kind of Jewish house is it? But if I'm going to tell my husband, listen, let's spend some, a few dollars. For, she goes, what? Mezu no, 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 it's protection for the house. It's not a protection. It's not, doesn't do anything. It's a waste of money. He doesn't believe in it. So can I steal some money from my husband in order to protect the house, in order to do the will of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, to put a mezuzah on the doorpost? A boy say, what do you say? That's exactly why she's asking. A husband who gets married signs on the ksuba that he will support his wife in various ways. If she becomes sick, he has to heal her. If, she becomes, if she's kidnapped, he has to release her. He has to provide clothing and food and also a roof under, uh, over her head. A Jewish house is defined by four walls with a mezuzah. That's why she's asking what she's asking. He's not providing it for me. So he's not doing what he's supposed to. 
So can I help him, even though he doesn't know, to do what he needs to do? <clears throat> Sorry. No. no. Why not? It's my own husband. I'm not stealing from someone else. And you know what I plan to do? I'm planning to steal from my husband. And when he's going to see these mezuzahs, I'm going to tell him, you know, this chesed organization, there's all kinds of chesed organizations. There's Chabad and there's uh, gateways and all kinds of people that love helping other Jews. And they sent us some mezuzahs. So would you mind putting them up? If he will see that somebody else sent it, he didn't have to spend a dollar on it, he would do it. Correct. I'm asking you. I think you, you may be thinking about the reverse. It's a sugi and Shabbos of Dalad and Eruvin Lamed Bay is a big toysfist over there on the left hand side. Can you sin in order to save someone? But you're saying the reverse. Are you suggesting Zachin La Adam Shalom Befanov? You're allowed to do something for another person to acquire something for him even though he's not aware of it? But that's not exactly about doing a mitzvah. You're allowed to acquire assets for somebody even though he is not aware of it. I'm not sure that the Rambam says about doing a mitzvah. I don't remember where it says it. No, it's not made out of the Rambam. Okay, so for next time you have to find me the source. I just remember hearing it that you can do, because they will approve it, they will approve that when you do the mitzvah, even without their neshama, will be happy that you did it. So this is what she wants to know. Can she do that? So you're saying yes. But your friend said you're not allowed to. What's that? But the main thing the husband's supposed to supply to her to have a... Is a house. A Jewish house is defined... With one with a mezuzah. Supply, so he didn't supply what he's supposed to? So you're helping him avoid doing something wrong. You're helping him doing... So you're saying go for it. You're saying go for it. So you would suggest stealing a lot of money for a beautiful mezuzah or just a regular kosher standard? Just to get by. Anyone disagrees? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says in Pashas Naso and Bamidbar that in order to ensure there's Shlom Bais, even though it's an Isu Toira to erase Hashem's name, Hashem allows you to erase His name when the Isha Soita comes along in Beis Amigdash, we erase Hashem's name just to maintain Hashem's name. So therefore you're saying it's better to continue living in a place without a mezuzah, but we found a fix. We found a way to have the mezuzah and still have the Shlom Bais because she's going to tell him, I didn't steal. Somebody sent this to us. There's great Jews around, and they love helping other Jews. If I care, it's going to be a uh, Shalom Bayes problem if there's no mezuzah. You hear that? Maybe it's going to be a bigger problem to the Shalom Bayes because there is no mezuzah, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't like when people don't do what he commands us to do. She should. Very good. Very good. We just have to question if it's correct. According to the Mordechai, the Mordechai is one of the Rishonim, there is no Isu to live in a place without a mezuzah. The Torah commands a mitzvah's essay, a positive mitzvah. Thou shalt place a mezuzah on the doorpost. It doesn't say in the negative formulation, you are not allowed to live in a place without a mezuzah. And therefore she's not transgressing every minute. He is nullifying a mitzvah essay, a positive mitzvah, to put the mezuzah, but one is allowed to live in a place without a mezuzah. So the answer to this lady was, she should not steal, for a few reasons. First of all, you're not transgressing an issue. Second of all, it's not even your house. It belongs to the husband. The mitzvah is on his shoulders, not on yours. And therefore, you're not doing anything wrong. And you are allowed to live in this house. Your husband is doing something very, very wrong. But imagine, if you steal, and ultimately, he will find out. Can you imagine the Chilul Hashem that's going to come out of it? Oh, great religion you have there. Great religion. Stealing in order to do a mitzvah. Beautiful. I really want to be showing my Torah mitzvahs now. 
tremendous chilul Hashem. Since the, she is be'oinis, she is forced not to do this mitzvah, and it's not even her house, and the Mordechai who taught us that there is no isu to live in a place like this, and therefore the answer to her was, do not steal in order to put a mezuzah. Since we have just a few minutes left, I want to finish with some observations about yesterday's Pasha. We read about Avraham Avinu. And you know, the Pasha starts with tremendous praise that Chazal give to Avraham Avinu for Achnasa Solchim. So much so that in Shabbos Kuf Chafzayin, Chazal say, greater it is to receive the guest than to be talking to HaKadosh Baruch Tremendous praise. At the end of the Pasha, again, unbelievable praise. Avraham Avinu was willing to shecht, to slaughter his own son. But you know, if you analyze these two acts, they're useless. You're giving food and drinks to whom? The angels, they don't eat it. They don't eat and they don't drink. So your whole effort here, 99 years old, hot, boiling outside, three days after your circumcision, you're weak and tired. It was for naught. Wasteless effort. Akedas Yitzhak. You're going with Yitzhak. A whole big production. Three days. You're taking Eliezer and Ishmael. And at the end, you didn't even slaughter him. Wasteless effort. The answer is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not look at the result. He doesn't care what's going to happen tomorrow because it's not up to you. What's going to happen in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's world is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's decision. What you have to do is what you have to do today. And what's going to happen as a result tomorrow has nothing to do with you. It's not your cheshboinus. The biggest proof. Last Pasha, last week, Pasha Slech Lecha. Avraham Avinu converts multitudes of people. How many people? The Lashon of the Rambam. Nikibetsu elav revavos ve'alafim. Tens of thousands of people gathered to Avraham and he converted them. Tell me, where are they? Where are all those people? We're talking about tens of thousands. Where are they? The most amazing answer is found in Merdish Perked Rebeliezer. And the Mendish says, the Chulan Chazru Lesuram. And they all went sour. They all went back. What a waste of time. No, it's not a waste of time. Because the Kodesh Baruch Hu praises him in his Torah and says, Ve'es ha-nefesh asher asu ve-charan. The souls they had created, they fashioned in Charan. What do you mean create? You create souls? Yes, when you convert them. But wait a second, they all went sour. So what good was that? The answer is if HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants them back, he will find a way to bring them back. And if HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want them back, he won't bring them back. But it's not up to you. What you have to do is do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants every single day, all day long. What will happen as a result is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's cheshbon, not yours. And you know perhaps what is the biggest praise to, HaKadosh, to Avram Avinu? HaKadosh Baruch Hu commands him, I want you to go now to Shech Yitzhak. No problem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He takes out his GPS. What should I, what, what address? Just start walking. sham le'oila al dehorim. You're gonna be pointed over there to one of the mountains. Yeah, yeah. But where? I just want to put in the uh, the address. What address? Destination unknown. What do you mean? Avraham Avinu says to Kodesh Baruch Wait a second. Who do I call? CNN. Let me too 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 much to the left. Fox News. Can have some of my friends there. Facebook. Instagram, I'll be able, this is the biggest opportunity for a Kiddush Hashem ever in the history. A man who is 99 years, 100 years old, is willing to shecht his son, that Hashem promised him, this will be your continuation, Claudius Yisrael will come out from this. It doesn't make a difference, Kodesh Baruch I love you and I'm willing to do this, but let's make it big. We'll put flyers all over. It's that generation of social media. Let's make it happen. And the Kodesh Baruch says, no, you know who's going to be there? You, Yitzchak, me, and one ram. Avraham Avinu says, that's a waste of time. It's just a waste. Such a big opportunity, just us. Let's make it big. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says no. And that's the biggest praise to Avraham Avinu. Because everybody is willing to be Moisel Nefesh once. Something spectacular. And tomorrow I'm going to be in the paper. And for the next week, they're going to talk about me in the radio, and TV, all over, all the magazines, front cover. But to be willing to do the right thing every single day, all day, when nobody is watching, that's the biggest praise. You're going to commit now the biggest thing ever, shechting your son when no one is around. No pictures, no internet, no fax, no SMS, no nothing. The biggest praise. 
the biggest accolade to a person is that he's willing to do what a Kodesh Baruch Hu wants every single day, all day long, even though he's in four doors, four walls, and no one watches. So I want to just end with saying something which may seem provocative. Maybe I will sound like a little like a heretic, but nobody is recording this, right? Only one person. <laughs> Door is closed, nobody's listening. Okay. You know what I think? The biggest praise, Akedas Yitzchak, is way, way overrated. Not impressive, not a big deal at all. Thought you were going to throw something at me. I'll tell you why. Avraham Avinu is the biggest Maimin in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is the biggest believer in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? It's a no-brainer that if HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls and says, listen, I want you to go shech your son now. Okay, you're Hashem. It's your world, not mine. I may be disappointed, but it's, after all, your world. So of course he's going to do it. What's the Chiddush? What's the novel thing here? Whoa, Avraham Avinu, 90, 100 years old, willing to shech the son. Of course he will. Avraham Avinu was willing to go into the fire for Hashem and was willing to do everything for Hashem. He understands that everything he has, and including this son, is only from Hashem. So why wouldn't he do it? It's not a big deal, and I don't think it's impressive. It's not my question. Two great people asked this question. The Nitziv, the Havik Dava, and the Shem Ishmuel. The Nitziv says, you know what the test was? Not if he's going to do it. Of course Avraham Avinu is going to do it. The, the, the test was, let's see, are you going to ask any questions? Of course you're going to do it, but will you doubt the Kodesh Baruch Hu? And Avraham Avinu gets up in the morning and runs to do it. No questions asked. And that's the big challenge that he passed. And that's his biggest praise. But the answer of the Shem Mishmuel is an unbelievable answer. Says the Shem Mishmuel, the son of the Avni Nezer. The challenge was to Avraham, we know you're going to do it. But let's see what your emotional reaction will be when you hear you have to shech your son. What was the emotional reaction of Avraham Avinu? He rose up real early, first flight out, 4 o'clock, 4 a.m. He was in Newark. Wait, you don't go 4 o'clock in the morning when you're not excited and happy about it. So Avraham Avinu was happy and he passed the test. But if that's not conclusive evidence, the biggest one comes a little later. While he's about to shech Yitzhak, suddenly he hears an angel saying, Stop! Don't do it! And we have a rule. In Shabbos Daf Lamed Beis, Chazal say, Ein ha-shechina shoira, ela mitoch simcha shel dvar mitzvah. Shechina, communication with the Kodesh Baruch can only happen if you're happy doing a mitzvah. So it must be that Avraham Avinu was happy. That's the challenge that he passed. Let's take it a step further. Imagine. Imagine Avraham Avinu did it because he had to do it. Sometimes your wife tells you, you gotta throw out the garbage. So you do it. You better do what your wife tells you. But you're not excited about it. Avraham Avinu was happy doing it. How do you know? Because he had communication with Hashem. So let's imagine Avraham Avinu goes out to Shechtim because the Kodesh Baruch commanded. But he's not happy. What would happen? He wouldn't hear the angel. If he wouldn't hear the angel, he would Shech Yitzchak. If he Shech Yitzchak, there is no Yaakov. If there is no Yaakov, there are no 12 tribes and there is no Tiferes Bahu in Somerset, New Jersey, all of us here today. So again, why are we here today? Because many years ago, our collective grandfather did one mitzvah, besimcha. He was happy doing the will of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Imagine what a mitzvah besimcha can do. What it can create years later. So he mitzvah Hashem. We should all be zoiche to do all the mitzvahs of Hashem all day long, every day, with tremendous Tremendous excitement. Simcha, Islavus. We are the chosen people. The Kodesh Baruch Hu selected us. There's so many people around, but he decided, no, you. I want you to be my special people. Carrying it all my mitzvahs and becoming a mamlech eskoyad in vegoi kadosh. It's a tremendous chus to be here today. And I thank all of you for being involved in sharing Torah mitzvah. The next year we will share together will be in Eretz Yisrael where we're all holding hands, dancing in front of Beis Amidash with Mashiach Tzidkenu. Amen. <laughs>